welcome back to the Gnostic. I got some uh, echoing going on. It's okay. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to obtain it. Who's, is that yours, Derek? Uh. <laughs> uh hold on, hold on. Let me just see if it was still going. Echo, echo. I'm good. I'm okay, good. I think we're good now. Test, test, okay. test. I think we're, I think we're good. All right, okay. well, let's start this all over again. <laughs> Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true gnosis. And I got Dr. Richard Carrier today, so you know what we're about to do. We're talking about some uh, some mythicism, some naughty stuff, some naughty, naughty, naughty stuff. But um, first of all, Derek's here. What's up, Derek? Yeah. I Listen, I really didn't – I'm not going to be here for the whole show. Um, and some people are going to be like, good. I'm glad that guy's not going to be here. <laughs> but here's the deal. I am here – to be a shameless plug, I just got done going. I, I literally zipped to go dump a full six by 17 foot trailer, sweating, you know what, like crazy, took a shower, jumped on here. I, I want to, I just want to say something. I want this to be authentic. I want this to be sincere. And for anyone who watches this live or not live, it doesn't matter. I am really working hard right now. Um, Richard Carrier recently lost his family or one of his family members. It was your mother, father mom yeah so you know how difficult it is relocating moving trying to get stuff taken care of like you went through a lot of stress yeah the last six months i was taking care of the family house to get it re ready for sale um so it was a lot of construction work reno work and all the other minutiae and moving yeah tons of stuff trying to figure out where things go and all that it's super stressful and that's what i've been yeah. going through oh very yeah painting remodeling i'm trying to get this house up ready for sale it's my mother and father's house actually and they've allowed us to live here um, and so I'm trying to make that sell for them and make them proud. Hopefully we can get them some good money out of it or whatever. But, um, while I've been doing this, I have been having endless countless videos on my Patreon. And of course, ones that I make public edited by Gnostic informant, like Neil has been, I don't know what kind of meth he is. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Scratch that. Scratch that. Start over. Start over. Um, I don't know what he's made out of. I want what he has. And so I just want to give you a shout out. And I seriously want anyone who really loves this stuff, whether you disagree with this guest or agree with that guest, that doesn't matter. That's what it's all about, right? It's all about finding what you think makes sense. And then you might change your damn mind at some point. Go, what the, this is where it looks like it's going now. Please support Gnostic Informant. Please support the scholars you love because if you don't, they have to follow the money to survive. Go on to richardcarrier.info. Go check him out on his blog. You can check out his articles. You can be a Patreon member. One-time donation in terms of PayPal. I'm, I'm literally being a shameless plug. That's literally why I'm here <laughs> right now. Then I'm going to dip and let you guys enjoy your episode. I, I hope... People will go support him, but also I want to give a special shout out to Neil's uh, Patreon because if it weren't for the people who support me on Patreon, I would be up shit creek. I'm not kidding you. If it weren't for the people who helped me out and supported me on Patreon, YouTube is so it, it, it doesn't know how to make its mind up. Oh, this month you're making this much. Next month you're making that much. And it literally, you were trying our hardest to work the algorithm but I'm telling you, it's where it's at. And there's private, exclusive content, early access, private messaging, you name it. Or if you have a certain, certain question you want to ask Neil, he might can do a special thing for you, whatever. Just like I've hired Dr. Richard Absolutely. Carrier to do work for me. I've hired him to do research. I've flown out to California and did in-person interviews asking my Patreon member questions. I know for a fact Neil's going to do the same thing. So I, I literally wanted to come in and be look like the idiot on purpose, take the blame <laughs> off of you guys and say, support your content creators. We're going to keep doing what you guys want, but we need your help. That's all. That's all I got. If there's something else I'm missing, please tell uh, me now. Just throw up the full blog for, for carrier real quick. Okay. Like yeah, guys, this is really a lot of, lot of knowledge in here, guys. A lot of gnosis. <laughs> <laughs> I love gnosis. No, but I, I literally am a frequent reader of his blogs there's a lot of really interesting stuff from a scholarly perspective from a a, a real expert in the field so guys go go out there right now and richard carrier.info really i just, I just yeah. did that video that uh 
Richard, the one I did top 10 dying and rising God myths, literally used your entire article. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's such a good article too, by the way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I I gave you credit, of course, but I like wanted to know this is Richard's article. I tapped in a few things of my own, but if you liked that video, that's the kind of content you bring. So, yeah, and that's a good that article is a good example. We're talking about uh, dying and rising gods. It's pagan guys get over it. Um, that's the title. Uh, the the that's the kind of content that doesn't exist if we're not being supported by Patreon. Yeah, uh, so, so that's, I, that's, that's my main it. income is is my supporters on Patreon. So. Um, the people who are, who are patrons there remind me when they when they message me. I take time to like answer their questions and things like that. So, um, but but yeah, that article it goes into detail of the sorts of things that, for whatever reason, just don't get published in the field anywhere else. Or if they do, they're not really accessible to most people. Um, and yeah. so uh, that's the kind of content we're creating is the access to scholars and scholarship that uh, is difficult to get to, or won't be organized in one place otherwise, uh, but for it. So, uh, and then of course I put all the, I put the links, I put the references so you can actually, you can fact check it. Like you can yeah. double check, right? You don't have to rely on my just assertions. Uh, and that's what makes it valuable, right? Is it, it's an actual resource that is, uh, deeply hyperlinked and referenced. And, and that's the kind of content that I produce both in philosophy and in history. Yeah. And, that, and that's exactly why I said it was, this, we're going to talk about some naughty stuff because it really is like to a lot of mainstream scholars, it's like they don't even want to talk about this stuff because they think that it's like somebody's going to look at them like, oh, why are you yeah, saying it's that? a third rail that, yeah, it'll, it'll yeah. create a hit to their reputation, cause right. all sorts of status problems that they have to deal with. And they'd rather not have to deal with it. Uh, and, and this is a phenomenon that happens with a lot of things like this. It's not just uh, not just this particular topic, but it's a kind of general psychology. I noticed when I, I did a series a long time ago on women in philosophy, where I interviewed women uh, who, were, who were philosophers, actual PhDs, published philosophers. And I had a lot of uh, women turned me down at the time because their reasoning was, is like, oh, look, I'm already a woman in philosophy. The last thing I need to be associated with is atheism. Then I'm, then I'm getting harassed and, and you know, uh, dealing with all of the sort of career stress for two reasons instead of just one. Uh, and so this is the same kind of thing. People will avoid these third rails because it's just too much work to push back against all of the, the vitriol and harassment and other peer pressure and things that, that don't have anything to do with evidence or reason that, that are not legitimate reasons to oppose or make people's life difficult. But people will make your life difficult in academia if you don't sing the right party lines. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I had to, to scroll, let everybody see. I hope, Neil, let me know. Uh, fingers crossed someone joins your patreon by the end of this I appreciate episode that, Eric. appreciate that. yeah and keep up the good work guys i thank you for letting me come on and be a shameless plug for you guys because i have been getting amazing support from from people and making sure it's possible and i say that as in like you with editing i wouldn't know what to do man so thank you thank you yeah awesome i'm out enjoy i'm watching i'm listening Alrighty. and i'm working <laughs> around the house all right awesome. take it easy Bye. kick ass so I see, <laughs> yeah, I see. There's a few super chats already. Yeah, let's hit them. Well, if, I was you gonna, want. if you want, we can sort of talk about this. Let's, you want to just hit them? Yeah, we yeah. Can. Well, we can just hit them, and then as I'm sure you have a list of things you want to go into, we can, yeah. we can get into those at any time. But we don't really have to have a structure to this. So, okay. uh, yeah, let's let's do it. Okay. Yeah, because there's so much we could talk about. All right. Why do people say Jesus has more evidence than Alexander the Great? <laughs> <laughs> that's all. It's one of those questions. that's almost like, uh, you know, the, the question is its own answer. But um, it's uh, the, the, it's weird that people don't know that this happens. I, I'm astonished that it happens. And I uh, people who know my work know that I use this as an example uh, in um, on the history of city of Jesus, where there's there's an actual scholar who said this. Uh, and, and I go into like all the ways why this is a ridiculous statement. Like the evidence we have for Alexander the Great is vast. If we had that kind of evidence for Jesus, we would not be debating this. It would be an undebatable subject, really. Um, so the question is then why? Why do they do this? Um, I'm able to just I'm, pull this up real quick. We have archaeology that are yeah. basically the equivalents of an Alexander was here. Yeah, lots of stuff like that. That's just one example. But yeah, yeah there's there's tons, right? But also even just in texts, like our textual evidence is so much better. Um, and usually the claim will be like, well, no one wrote about Alexander the Great until 500 years after the fact. And it's like, that's totally not true. Right. Uh, there are tons of on the walls. It's on the walls. Ptolemy has them on the walls in Egypt. 
The story. Yeah, I mean, and but even I'm just saying, like, yeah, there's tons of archaeology. Yeah, that's right. and and that's ridiculous to say that we have we don't have that archaeology for Jesus. Come on, exactly. Uh, right, writing doesn't. So, so usually writing. the argument goes to texts, right? So we right. have contemporary. We have tons of contemporary attestation of Alexander the Great. We have literally no contemporary attestation to the historicity of Jesus. The closest thing we have would be like Paul's letters, even though he never met Jesus or saw him or anything. But Paul's letters are hopelessly vague as to whether Jesus was someone who walked around on earth, right? So that's that's the problem with that text. Whereas the, the contemporary texts that attest to Alexander the Great are not vague about his historical existence as an actual political person. Uh, and so th we just don't have, if we had that kind of evidence for Jesus that we have for Alexander, it would be a non-starter. Non but plus we have tons more evidence uh, in textual evidence including historical evidence that is structured according to the standards of rational history at the time, right. which we have none of for Jesus, right? right. So and then that by itself doesn't mean Jesus didn't exist, but sure. you can't claim that we have the same evidence for Jesus as we have for Alexander the Great. Yeah. And this example of the 500 year thing where they'll say, wow, no one wrote about him for 500 years. They're talking about Arian, who was this Roman historian who wrote one of the comprehensive biographies right. of Alexander the Great. And Arian tells us his method. He says, I took three books that were written by eyewitnesses who traveled with Alexander the Great. A royal and, Journal. Called it. He called yeah, it and that, right. And, and, and everywhere where they agree, I just tell the story. Where they disagree, I'll mention the disagreements. And, and he follows this method more or less closely. Not, not entirely, but, but fairly well. But we don't even have that for Jesus. We don't have someone saying, well, I found these, these memoirs written by people that knew Jesus, and, and I use these three, and this is why they're authoritative, and this is how I use these sources. We don't have anything like that for Jesus, right? So, so even the Arians book, which is 500 years later, is based on contemporary uh, sources and is methodological. Like He's explicit about his methodology, and we, we don't have that uh, for Jesus. So, so yeah, there's multiple reasons why this is a ridiculous claim. So the question is why? Why would they say this? And I think... Uh, it's one half laziness. Um, so, so the authors, the, everybody who says this, well, some people who say are liars, but most people who say it assert it because they just assume it's true. They didn't check, right? They, they don't do the actual work of a historian to go. They don't stop and say like, what, wait, 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 is that true? Like, should, I should check first, right? Before I say this, they're just too lazy to check. And the reason they're too lazy to check is the other reason that they do this is that they're just so uh, terrified of the, the theory, thesis and so in need of making sort of adamant hyperbolic assertions to keep people in line that that they need to just they need this to be true right they need the statement to be true uh and and they just therefore arrogantly assume it must be true oh, it must be true right and so then they just assert it but it's all an attempt to control the belief of the reader right rather than educate themselves or the readers right so they, they it's all in the aid of we can't handle the challenge to this thesis so we need to shut that thesis down by outrageous hyperbolic assertions that that will basically convince people to no longer question it yeah. uh the, now this has the unfortunate side effect that as soon as anyone checks they find out that this is a bullshit statement uh and so they've actually shot themselves in the foot because now they've actually made people deeply question historicists like their methodology their carefulness their reliability is in deep question when they make statements like this and it actually reinforces the popular view that that there actually isn't a good case for the historicity of Jesus. And so it's actually ending up discrediting Jesus studies as a historical field, and, and the, whereas they should be going the opposite direction and making careful, well-researched statements, you know, honest arguments instead of this sort of hyperbolic nonsense that's not even remotely true. Right. And, and just to, I just want to sort of compare something real quick, because we don't, when it comes to the the, the sources for the New Testament, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So we, we have these dating, pro we date them to like, you know, 70s, 60s, 50s, 90s, whatever you want to do, whether, whether you, whether you date them late or early, doesn't matter. The point is, as far as physical copies of these evidences, they don't come till the 300s. And then before that, it's little fragments, little pieces of paper. So you can argue that, okay, textual criticism shows that they copy these really well. Sure. You can, you can do that all you want. But the same thing applies for someone like Alexander the Great. You ex you can't expect them to hold on to papyrus from three twenty five or two seventy BCE and have it passed down till today. It's not going to happen. Yeah, so you can't yeah. have it both ways. You can't say, "Oh, we don't have any physical copies of this." Well, actually, we do because it turns out that the walls on the walls of Luxor, Ptolemy had the whole story written down. Of Alexander going to the Siwa Desert, meeting Amon, finding out he was the son of God, and then getting told that he would conquer the world. 
We didn't know about that till we till we crack hieroglyphics in like the 19th century. So the fact that the story lines up with Arian and Diodorus of Sicily right. yeah. and all these other and Rufus, all of their stories line up with the with the archaeology. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a bad, it's a really bad example. And it, it astonishes me because you could pick an easier example, although they would right. be less impressive, right? So oh, you say like I have, I have pick like really minor figures, like minor but, figures that hardly anyone wrote about. Like the, then you could make your case, right? Check but, this out. Yeah. Uh, so I had I had Bart Amernot and I asked him about, you know, so we don't have any physical evidence of Jesus, which is all it's all hearsay from he he brought up a he brought up a um an example of the high priest Caiaphas, mm-hmm. and I thought about this. I'm like, okay, that's a good point. That's this also is- a bad example because we have his uh, bone box. But, but anyway, well, look, they, they, that's what he <laughs> said. Physical archaeology. He said we finally found his bo- bone box, but before yeah. that, there was nothing. Well, that's not exactly true because Josephus writes about him. Um, but not only that, it's like he he fits a puzzle of history. He's a, one of the high priests of a line of high priests. That means if he didn't exist, then who was the high priest? There's well, no yeah, answer for that. Right. At, for the way Jesus, I, there's a Jesus. different way to put that. There's a different way to put that, which is that Caiaphas is a figure of mundane history. Um, and if you look at what the trends are in the writing of history, mundane political figures are not usually made up, right? If you go and if you look, gra- gather all these guys, you put them all in a box and you went and counting how many of these are made up? Like, very few. Most they're usually so. If, if it's some mundane political figure like the high priest uh, in a period that we know is well documented, uh, even if we don't have the documents now, the prior probability that they're historical is actually quite high. But this doesn't work for Jesus, because Jesus belongs to not mundane history, but sacred history. And when you look at figures like religious founders and savior figures and heroes and stuff in that category. It's the other way around. They're usually made up, right? So like, like it's it's actually, it's not that none existed, uh, but the, the frequency is low. And so you actually need evidence to establish the historicity of Jesus that you don't need for Caiaphas, right? Because Caiaphas, you can already say, well, prior probability favors his existing. We don't have any particular reason to doubt his existence. Whereas Jesus fits into a category of people that usually didn't exist. So we do have a reason to doubt that he existed, the reason that doesn't apply to Caiaphas. And that's why we need more evidence for Jesus than we have for Caiaphas. And yet we have more evidence for the historicity of Caiaphas than we have for Jesus. For Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that's that's how bad it is. Uh, and it's, it is frustrating when historians won't admit this. Uh, they can't challenge it. It's, it's a f- established fact. Anybody can check this and confirm that it is the case. Uh, and, and it's a problem. And, and I think... You know, honesty requires admitting that this is a problem for historicity. And yeah, and I, I'm someone who's actually, I actually think there probably was a guy, but it's like the, the what, what I, what I find, the reason why I like to have these conversations is because when you hear stuff like, oh, it's like comparing the moon being cheese, like, like when you think, like people say it's like a big conspiracy that, like it's completely whack job. Not, I, I don't understand why they're saying that. Like this is a thing that could be true. Yeah. Uh- Well, so here's for atheist audiences, you know, for Christians, obviously, they have a particular course in this race. Uh, But for people who who would be open to Jesus not existing because they don't need him to exist, like it's not necessary for anything. Um, But the example I give is the resurrection. Uh, And it's very clear that when you look at the history, the actual historical course of the resurrection belief, that it started out as inner visions. You experience the resurrected Jesus inside your mind, basically. He, He appears to you in like Paul says in me. So Jesus revealed himself in me and, you know, he, he has conversations in his head with, with Jesus and all this stuff. It, it wasn't Jesus showing up in a body, hanging around, having dinner with you. Like th- that is not what happened originally. But by the time we get to the gospels, we, we have all of these like suspiciously elaborate, detailed autopsy of the stories where Jesus shows up, hangs out, eats fish, has dinner with them, asks them to touch him, you know, and like, Oh, like here's the wound and all, you know, all this stuff. Uh, that sort of that sort of flesh based showing up hanging out basically zombie Jesus uh, that was completely made up and pretty much all mainstream scholars admit this right they, they all admit that that is not how Christianity began though those are legends that were written to sell the faith in the Gospels so but that requires no conspiracy even though the the belief changed radically from inner experiences of the risen Jesus to dinner table Jesus. Like and, and did that within like 40 years time, 
uh, no one has any, no mainstream scholars have any problem with this is, oh yeah, it's totally explicable as to how that the story could change, why it would become important to the faith to insist that that's what happened, even though that's not what originally was said what happened and so on. So you can totally explain it without some sort of massive conspiracy theory and no one thinks that it's weird. Uh, it, it's actually normal for religions to have this kind of legendary development. And if you could have a non-historical, like imaginary Jesus that's risen, the risen Jesus is an imaginary Jesus, right? Even if the, the non-risen Jesus, the pre-dead Jesus is a real guy, Risen Jesus is not, right? We, we, you know, mainstream scholars will admit this. Atheists have to admit this. It's like, yes, he was imaginary. And then the historical undead Jesus is made up, right? Everybody agrees, other than the Christians, that uh, undead Jesus is a made up. There's no historical undead Jesus. We're all, we're all on agreement with that. But if there's no historical undead Jesus, and yet they could invent this undead Jesus, historical undead Jesus in a 40-year time, what's to stop them inventing the rest of Jesus? Right, so like, what what is the difference? Like, it's just you're just adding more days to the invented Jesus. So that, that that's the that's why it doesn't really require uh, uh, conspiracy theories. It's not really that wild when you think about it. It's just that when you mention the historicity of Jesus, all other all our memories of how history works and how religions work and how mythology works, we forget it all because we're so terrified of oh my god, how dare you touch that third rail? You don't step back and think like that's actually no different than questioning the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah, uh, I, and, and I think that's important. I, I brought that out in my book, Jesus from Outer Space. So th this yeah. argument, if you're interested in seeing me a write up of it, it's in there. Yeah, and I also think even the the parts of his life, people that think are historical, even some of the even some of those traits, you can actually look at and say, wait, that's not that sort of sounds like someone else in history. It sort of sounds like another mythology. And yeah. so there's always there's always it gets really cloudy of what is myth and what's not. It gets yeah. really cloudy. And mainstream scholars will admit that, right? So this is another thing that happens with Christian apologetics is that they'll say uh, mainstream scholars agree there was a historical Jesus, and then they'll immediately jump to, therefore, the Gospels are reliable sources. And it's like, no, mainstream scholars do not agree with you on that. Mainstream scholars think most of what's in the Gospels is made up. Most of what we are told about Jesus is made up. That's the mainstream view. It's a consensus. Right. They agree, right? That it's mostly made up. Yeah. Uh, and And... and but, you know, that that's dangerous to admit, right, for a Christian to admit. It's not dangerous for an atheist to admit. You can easily right. say, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's mostly legends. There's just a core story of Jesus. Uh, I was just in a debate recently where um, uh, uh, where the argument was that the only thing we can know about Jesus is that he was crucified. Um, and, and you know, that, that's a really minimal Jesus. That, that's about, yeah. as, you know, almost as minimal as you can. But the imagine. fact that it happens on Passover Eve, which is people people think is, ha is historical. Right. That's like, I mean, wait a minute, he's the Passover lamb and he's got killed. Oh, well, yeah, minute. yeah. And mainstream scholars will say that that narrative is probably false because it, it's highly yeah. anachronistic. There, there's no way that, first of all, like capital crimes trials had to take two days. The Gospels, it happens in only one uh, there's, there's, there's like a whole bunch of standard laws of the way courts worked back then that are completely violated by the gospel story. And mainstream scholars are okay with admitting this. It's like, yeah, this, the, he was, the crucifixion was moved to a particular theologically significant date and the time was compressed and all these other, lots of details were taken out of the Psalms. There's a, you know, there's a lot of the things that you see happen in, in, in the crucifixion, the passion narrative are literal, almost verbatim lines from Psalm 22, for example, uh, the dividing of the, the clothes with lots, for example. And, and, you know, it's like all these things is, yeah, they dressed it up, uh, but the crucifixion still happened it's somewhere at some time, maybe not in all of these respects or whatever. Uh, many mainstream scholars will even say that maybe Jesus probably hung, hung on the cross for several days, um, which is possible if he didn't die. Uh, but if he did die, which would be weird, it actually wasn't typical to die immediately upon being crucified. You, you actually, the whole point of it was that you would suffer for several days before you died. And stay uh, there until you're a skeleton. Basically. Well, so that wouldn't happen in Judea. And this is, this okay. is important. Uh, so, so even like Bart Ehrman will say what you just did and say like, oh, well, yeah, they would just leave it up and rot or throw him into a mass grave or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, and they cite a lot of examples of that's how the normal procedure was. But however, at this time, in the 30s AD, Rome and Judea had a treaty arrangement uh, because the Jews actually helped out uh, Julius Caesar and, right. and Augustus. Right. And so right. they were actually given certain treaty privileges. Uh, and one of them was that the Jewish law would be adhered to within Judea. And Jewish law mandated that the dead had to be buried before sunset. Uh, and so, so the Romans were actually bound by treaty right. to obey that rule, that law there in that one particular place, not throughout the Roman empire, just in that 
in just in Judea. And so, so that, so the idea that he'd be left up, uh, normally that would be the case, but not in Judea. So it actually, this, the part where he's taken down before sunset does match practice, at least before the Jewish war. Uh, and so, but that's, you know, people knew this and even after the war, people knew this, they remembered how it used to be, uh, or knew people or read books about how it used to be. And so they could make, they could add that element as sort of what they just assumed to be a plausible story. Um, so it, not everything in the story is implausible, but there is a lot of it that is, that it contradicts the way things happen. Yeah, of course. Thank you for the super sticker, uh, fire sabers. I really appreciate that. And the next one's from Vesper. I like, I like the icon of super sabers. Yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> <Fire Saber. laughs> yeah. Vesper says, could the story of Jesus be both history and myth? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, that is the mainstream view, actually. Uh, you know, Christian apologists don't want you to say that, but, uh, but yes, the mainstream consensus is that it is both, right? There's a little bit of history there, but it's mostly embellished with myth. Um, I, I just take the view that the, the little bit of history, even that doesn't really have a good case for it. Uh, and that you can explain all the evidence even a little bit better, even with a little more success without any history to Jesus, uh, except for the history of people thinking they were talking to Jesus, which is, you know, when Paul says Jesus revealed himself in me and in second Corinthians 12, he talks about this whole conversation he had with spirit Jesus. Um, you know, that's not a real Jesus. Right. But, right. Uh, so, so there, there, but it is probably a historical event in the sense that Paul really probably did have that schizotypal conversation in his head and thought he was talking to Jesus that that actually could actually have happened. Um, but it doesn't and, mean there was a real Jesus behind it. And if you don't know the old Testament very well, you might miss it because they're like, I'll give an example. I, I talked to Mike Lacona about this and he just, just was like, no, I don't believe that. But anyways, <laughs> I, I, I disagree with him on this. And I think that the, the scene where G Pilate has Barabbas, Barnabas, and Jesus. Oh, yeah, Barabbas. Yeah. That is literally a reflection of Deuteronomy 16. Or is it Deuteronomy 6? I think it's Deuteronomy 16. Well, it, it's Leviticus. Um, Levit I'm sorry, Leviticus. Leviticus. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I can't remember. 16. You got, you got the scapegoat and you have the, 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 off, the sin atonement goat. The scapegoat's left free. The sin atonement mm -hmm. gets slaughtered for the sins. That's Yom Kippur. They're combining yeah. it with the Passover. So now he's the Passover lamb and he's also the sin atonement, which is a weird Christian thing. But still, you can right. clearly see there's no way there's a bunch of people in in Jerusalem that are all going to take part in this little little allegory of. of yeah, like, <laughs> yeah there's a lot of things that are not realistic. Pilate would not let a murderous rebel go free. There's there's no such there was no uh, no such holiday. Like so they talk about there's this practice, the custom on the holiday. There's no such thing. Uh, that was made up. No, it never happened. Um, right. No, it never, never, that kind of thing never happened. But the, the storyline, yes, it's obvious. And it's even more obvious when you notice that there's some manuscripts, some early manuscripts of Matthew. Actually, they call the guy Jesus Barabbas. Uh, so, so they actually have two Jesuses. So we actually have the twin exactly. ghosts the twin in the story. Uh, and uh -huh. we're not the first people to notice this. I, when I, so I noticed it and I was like, oh my God, like this is so obvious. How, how no one noticed this before? Uh, but when I did my postdoc research to, to produce uh, on the historicity of Jesus, I did my due diligence as a scholar and I did a literature review on this to see like, well, has anybody said this before? And I found several scholars in the peer reviewed literature had noticed this and then through them discovered that even Origen, the third century church father, uh, knew this and discusses it. Right. He talks about it. Um, now, Origen had the view that God arranged history to match the allegory that God intended, right? So he has a, a sort of supernatural way to make it work, but but he still admits that the mythic pattern is the reason that the story is being told. Uh, and, and the fact that there were several scholars who figured this out and published peer-reviewed articles on it, but didn't know about each other. So that was like three of us. There's me who independently came across this, and then two other guys who independently came across it. So that's three people, three times, who came across the same evidence and published it under peer review. Uh, but people just aren't reading their own literature, so they don't know that this has happened. Yeah, I just wanted to show yeah. people the details. Yeah, yeah. There. So yeah, and like and like and I and I asked him about. I asked Michael Cohen. Nothing wrong, with Michael Cohen. I like Michael. I like Michael Cohen. I think he's a great guy. Yeah, but I yeah he's, he's one of the more sincere uh, Christian apologists. Sure. Yeah. And I asked him. I go, don't don't you think that's pretty clear? Especially knowing that they're really what John. The Book of John says this was a yearly uh, um, tradition, which. We know we can look at all the history, Josephus, it never happens. It's not a yearly tradition. Yeah, no, no, right. And I asked him, I go, what, what do you say? He goes, well, the, the, there's a big difference. He goes, the, in this case, the uh, the sin atonement is killed inside, whereas Jesus was brought outside. And I go, uh, and I'm thinking, that's weak. That's a really <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's this, it's this idea of, it, 
lacks an understanding of how allegory works, right? Sure. The, whole, the whole point of allegory is that it's happening in different contexts in different ways. Polemicizing. And, right. So, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a syncretism essentially of uh, the story they want to tell for whatever reason and the message they want to send. And so they're not going to have, you know, the priests, uh, you know, slit Jesus's throat and let the blood flow over the altar. That would be too literal. Like I these didn't are way better. That. These are actually better authors than that. When I, be a terrible allegory. It would be like it would be too literal. And allegories don't work that way. They're, well, they're when I was, less when I was, literal. That's the point of them. When I was talking to Michael Kona, I didn't know this at the time. It wasn't even it wasn't even on my mind. But later on, because I'm just this is what I do. I read this stuff. I'm reading mm -hmm. ancient myths, ancient history, and I'm going through Hebrews again, and I realized that there's an the reason that the Hebrews. I, th I think it's Hebrews 12. I can't remember. It's somewhere in Hebrews. It tells you to come outside of the temple. Yeah, I think it's Hebrews 9. Possibly so that would answer the question of why the crucifixion is outside of the temple. And that's Yeah, there was a symbolic reason. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and as I talk about in On the History of City of Jesus, this same language gets used to talk about the celestial order. So, so uh, the, the, one, the Jews often thought of the, the organization of the cosmos. Uh, they thought of, the, let's put it this way, they thought the temple was an itself structurally an uh, allegory for the organization of the entire cosmos so that uh you know there there's the seven heavens and there's the ultimate vault in heaven where god resides well that would be the inner sanctuary and then as you go outer the outer levels of walls and stuff and like the walls of jerusalem represented the the firmament which separated the heavens from the atmosphere of the earth and stuff and so to be crucified outside the gate of jerusalem in cosmic terms meant being crucified somewhere in the atmosphere of earth. It could be on earth or it could be anywhere between earth and the moon uh, because inside the gate would be in the heavens. And, and there, there you can go through and you can show like even Hebrews is talking about like the importance of like, you can't actually die in outer space uh, unless you're dying below the moon because of the way that world, the way they thought the world worked. They thought it was like uh, everything was basically perfect and indestructible above that. But below that is the realm of decay that was controlled by basically demons and Satan who, who brought death into the world and, and controlled it all in the sphere below the moon. And the whole point of Jesus was to unbind that power, to basically restore God's ability to, to restore order to the world below. Uh, and, and ultimately, he was going to disintegrate it, right? He's going to melt it. That's the, the, the final end of, of the below the moon stuff, basically. It's all going to get disintegrated. Um, but when you understand it in this context, when they're talking about being crucified outside the gate, this is an obvious celestial allegory. Uh, and so... It, there's lots of ways to explain it that don't require denying the obvious symbolism. And they're outright telling you the symbolism. So like, you can't really deny the symbolism. Yeah. Um, that was, yeah, that's a great. And that, that, I think that explains that pretty good. Chris Wood. Thank you for the super chat. Appreciate all three of you just discovered myth vision and Gnostic informant. But Dr. Carrier has been instrumental in my deconversion. Where does he recommend for a lay person to start in philosophy? Ooh. Yeah, uh, good question. Um, I mean, obviously, I recommend my book, Sense and Goodness Without God, uh, which is basically my what my worldview was in 2005. There have been some changes since then, but not huge ones. Uh, but it's a good example. Even if you don't agree what's in the book, it's a good example of how to organize a complete worldview. So you can see what I'm doing there, and then you can use that as sort of a platform or a template to build your own worldview. Uh, using the same techniques and the same ideas uh, and, and figuring out what, like, for example, you got to figure out aesthetics. Like what is, what is beauty, for example, that, that you would think like that's a trivial question. It actually is really important. It ties into lots of things. Like a lot of our moral judgment is sometimes confused for, for aesthetic judgment and vice versa. But, um, and there's a whole aesthetic, uh, there's a whole supernatural versus natural aspect of how you explain these things. And so uh, for that, I would recommend starting there, Sense of Goodness Without God. But also uh, on my website, I have, if you go to my website, there's um, recommendations. One of the menu items is recommendations. It might be above that. It's, it's the one above that. Yeah, you can't see it on that screen. But, oh, there it is. Yeah. So one of those is recommendations. And if you go in there, um, I have a section on philosophy, getting started on philosophy. And it's basically the books that I recommend people start with. And obviously, you're not going to get all of them, but uh, it's kind of a sampler. Uh, the ones that are higher up are more important than the ones lower. Oh, the images aren't loading. Um, That's weird. Yeah. It, oh, here hopefully, we go. It's, hopefully it's not my website. <laughs> it's just the browser yeah. on your end, but yeah. uh, I might have to go back. It, probably, yeah, it might be. Um, <clears throat> But, but anyway, so I have recommendations there, uh, and that's a good place to start for that. Uh, also, I teach a one-month online course. It's uh, more of basically just a 
uh, sort of a asynchronous uh, bulletin board where we have conversations. You can ask any questions of me that you want and get answers. There are readings, there are assignment questions and things and so on. Um, where I teach, uh, one of those classes is worldview building. Uh, so it's introduction to philosophy. And then various others relate to, if you want to learn philosophy, you can learn it through one lens. And so, for example, I have philosophy and science of free will. Even if you think free will is a boring subject, there's so much, every aspect of philosophy is touched on with, with free will. So it's actually an exciting and interesting way to show how to do philosophy on a specific subject, which you can then adapt to other questions in the world. So, uh, so anyway, the classes might be helpful uh, for that, and you can check that out. Uh, that's also on the menu items there, uh, classes on our website. So that's why I would recommend one or all of those techniques to get started, and then uh, and then just do, you know, the self-directed study. Basically, is, as you find questions in philosophy that are interesting, go look for the latest, most prestigious writings on it and explore it from there. Um, there's tons of stuff, by the way, online now. There's a thousand word philosophy website that is getting a rather large archive of where they pick random topics in philosophy and write 1000 words on it. And these are by professional philosophers. Uh, so there's lots of interesting stuff to, to do to go explore. Uh, but I would suggest starting with something like Sense and Goodness Without God, because it gives you an idea of where the end goal, what you should be aiming for to build. Uh, and how you might go about doing that. Awesome. Why so religious? Thank you for the super chat. If Jesus existed as a rabbi at the time, would have believed thought Genesis as literal or taught? I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Is there a literal reading teaching historically? Uh, I don't know if the second question is. The first question depends. Uh, there actually were non literalists, there were allegorists uh, regarding the Genesis and other aspects of the old Testament, uh, Philo of Alexandria, who's a contemporary, um, is a good example of this. He has, he has several books on, on the Genesis story as allegory. Uh, yeah. and, and he goes in the, it, he, it, there's weird, like bizarre sci-fi stuff is his explanation of it, but it, it's, he doesn't take it literally. Uh, and he doesn't think you have to take it literally. And there were, there were many rabbis who took that camp. There were also rabbis who insisted you have to take it literally. So there were literalists, there were allegorists, they argued with each other a lot. Uh, so you had both camps and we, we don't really have, assuming Jesus existed, we don't have any reliable access to what he actually taught. So we don't know what camp uh, he was in uh, on this. Good question, good answer. Uh, Myth Vision Podcast is back. It says, what is the strongest argument for Jesus' existence, according to you, Dr. Carrier? Um, strong in the sense that we'd be better off without it. <laughs> It would create less confusion, I think, uh, is Paul's reference to the brothers of the Lord. Uh, and, and I think really all debates about the historicity of Jesus end there. Uh, is, is this good evidence for the historicity of Jesus or not? Uh, I think actually it's evidence against the historicity of Jesus. And the reason being is that Paul only ever tells us about fictive brothers of the Lord. He says all baptized Christians are brothers of the Lord. He never mentions biological brothers of the Lord. But he would have to if he meant biological brother of the Lord. Like if you know there's two kinds and they're both called brothers of the Lord and you are referencing one of them, you would need to make clear which one you meant, right? So if you're not doing that, that means you it's not occurring to you that you have to do that, which means you don't know about any other kind. You only know the one kind. Uh, and so that, that the fact that Paul doesn't specify, for example, brother of the Lord in the flesh or something like that, tells me that's actually slightly evidence in favor of Jesus not existing, or at the very least, Jesus not having actual brothers, which is also possible. He could have been a historical person who had no brothers. Right. Brothers right. were invented. So so either of those would fit that evidence. But um, but it takes a lot of understanding to get to that point of understanding the, how the evidence should be properly interpreted. And so until you get to that point, the brothers references are the best evidence that they that you know, historicists can appeal to. Uh, once you get past that to other evidences they cite, it gets weaker and weaker and less plausible, less plausible uh, as far as evidence goes. That's a really good point. I like that. That was a really good point. Jack Ball, thank you for the super chat. Have you seen Jay Bernier's book, new book, claims almost all the New Testament texts predate 70? <laughs> it's rogue. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's actually rogue. That's that's reactionary. It's more like going back to the Scopes monkey trial. Um, How, wait, isn't the Acts take part? Isn't the Acts the story of Acts take place after seventy? No, uh, okay. Acts the the history in Acts ends at roughly sixty two. Okay. AD. okay. Um, so so yeah, you you could get away with this 
um, it, it's massively implausible, uh, but uh, it, it is at least would be logically consistent uh, with a pre seventy date. I would say that, but uh, but it, it, improbability is too high for lots of reasons. But even the early, but no, I haven't read the book. I'm not aware. Uh, I I usually don't waste time on those kinds of uh, things because they, they're they're basically Ken Ham. But you know, you know, you know what's all. You know what also I kind of reject too is the flip side of that, where people have to put everything so far back. Like, oh, Paul's writings have to be in the '90s because whatever, whatever. The right, reason. right, yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be like that. And it's, we, let's let's keep it real here. You know right, I mean? and the similar based on similar disregard of probabilities, uh, and, and um, exactly. exactly right. So it's it's basically talking about what's possible, and then they'll throw in some sort of premises that they assert are true. Uh, and then, of course, the, con the conclusions follow from those premises, but you have no evidence for those premises or the evidence is weak or whatever. But um, so I find the argumentation is similar on the fringes of the dating of the Gospels. I rely on the traditional dating of the Gospels only because I don't need to push back against it to get uh, yeah. conclusions. I can argue a fortiori from the traditional, like the mainstream view of the, between 70s and 120 roughly is when, when they're getting written. Now, um, my views are completely compatible with the Gospels being later. Uh, and and, and, the, go and the Gospels being later is completely compatible with the evidence. Like there's the, the evidence for narrowing the dates of the Gospels is actually not great compared to a lot of other texts. Um, so, so, so it's possible that they're late. It's possible that they're early. I would think it's more, po more likely that they're late than that they're early. Um, but it's most likely, I would think like Mark feels the way it seems to be reacting so viscerally to the Jewish war in many ways, not just chapter 13, uh, feels like a seventies text to me, eighties at the latest. Um, Matthew's harder to date. Uh, Luke is excited by Josephus. So, uh, Luke is definitely writing in the late nineties or a decade or two after that. John is reacting to Luke. So we know John wrote after Luke, or at least our version of John. Uh, is reacting to Luke because John has gone through multiple redactions and we don't have the earlier text. So it's harder to, to date all the content of John. But um, so I, I think that stacks up to the traditional dates. I think make the most sense is the top of the probability curve. Uh, but I think that probability curve is, is fatter than most people allow. Uh, there's a lot more possibilities in there. Yeah. And I would probably, my own personal opinion, I just, I'd probably say Paul's, Paul's definitely pre 70, but the gospels are probably post 70. I think, yeah, I think right I, and, and most scholars would agree with that and and the evidence i think stacks up with the evidence definitely confirms that to a high probability that simple exactly. division this is a really good question from ted francis thank you for the super chat who are other dying and rising gods well there's a bunch uh and uh it depends also on how, what your criteria are for what constitutes that but um the clearest examples uh would be Zalmoxis, dionysus Romulus, Inanna, Osiris, and, uh, uh, one, one or another of the Adonises. There are actually several Adonises, but one of them did have a dying and rising uh, storyline. Um, there are others. I'm forgetting Esh some. Eshmon, the Phoenician healer god. He dies and rises. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Melkart, that Melkart. I'm less certain of, but what was that? Yeah. Melkart. Right, uh, right. Uh, so, so, yeah, there are actually some of the, the early, the pre-Hellenistic gods that became... Uh, mystery cults later so you have yeah you have Melkart. uh there there is a baal cult that actually worshiped the dying and rising baal um so so there's a bunch uh and for the scholarship and um evidence like the primary evidence and stuff you'll find that in my article online um, dying and rising gods it's pagan guys get over it uh and there's also a lot of dying and rising heroes who are not gods yeah uh, actually resurrection is like super popular concept all throughout uh, pagan mythology well, I mean, with Osiris, he basically is an embodiment of a resurrection. These are yearly agricultural uh, deity. Even Horus, by the way. Well, a lot of them started this way, right? So yeah. a lot of these resurrection cults were agricultural cults. Um, right. and, and, exactly. and they were communal. They're communal allegorical cults. Well, uh, but when you get into the Hellenistic period, however, they get co-opted into the Hellenistic correct. mystery religion model. And the uh, agricultural element becomes an individual salvation element. So right. uh, you, you see this in Demeter cult and Bacchus cult. Illusion so mysteries, yeah. Right, yeah. So like, so like, so that it changed over time. And so by the time we get to Christianity, these cults were preaching a very different model of dying and rising than the cults originally began with. Uh, so it's important to understand the historical context in which Christianity arose is different uh, from when the original dying and rising God myth, myths started, basically. Yeah, and then there's the, 
the another another thing I think is really like um, apparent, like really like when you read it, it just strikes you as like this sort of motif is when Demusi, Demusi is basically like tortured and um, it even says he's struck he's struck with a piercing nail and then he's killed and then Anana has to go down into the underworld and when she brings him up it even says she's down there for three days and when she brings him up his resurrection brings the dead up with him so, yeah and there's uh there's a similar story earlier told of Anana that we have on clay tablets that definitely predate christianity uh with the same three-day motif the the being nailed up and and the whole deal uh, yeah. the, hum- the humiliation of the death is really important there's right. a lot, lot right. of similarities that, that these were like tropes that were just commonly known and well known in at the time that, that we think are, we're surprised to hear where uh, there's a lot of christians will say like well no one would worship a, a humiliated god and it's like actually that was very common <laughs> very, you know the, the gods being humiliated uh being humbled uh having struggles being killed like uh, all of this stuff like even hercules had to uh, you know was was tasked with shoveling shit right, right. uh and, you know there's there's certain gods were like condemned to be a bricklayer for a certain amount of time yeah, there's lots of ways that they're being humiliated but this sort of like descent into humiliation and then sent back into glory this hero narrative gets told over and over again it was very common back then it was not an unusual sequence of events and just real quick not since we're on the subject i just wanted to pull this up this is samuel noah kramer's translation of the sumerian tablet mm. and it says that uh okay demutsi on the cheek with a nail let me just hold let me back up a little bit the first gala enters the sheepfold he strikes demuzi on the cheek with a piercing nail the second one enters the sheepfold he strikes demuzi on the cheek with the shepherd's crook the third one enters the sheepfold of the holy churn the stand is removed the fourth one enters the sheepfold the cup hanging on a peg from a peg falls the fifth one enters the sheepfold the holy churn shattered no milk is poured the cup lies shattered demuzi lives no more and this is right before it and Anna yeah. goes saves him, resurrects him. But the but what I think is interesting about that is that in Ezekiel, there's a reference to um God saying, Oh, look what's happening in the temple. Oh, they're they're weeping for Tamos. Yeah. And there's mm-hmm. gonna be abominations even worse than that. And so yeah. it's like they're aware right. of this text. Yeah, yeah. It shows you that th- these religions were were not only known in Jerusalem, that they're even like people like still practicing some of these Practice other cults. It, right. uh, the, the the sort of mythology of the Jews always being monotheistic and radically monolatrous yeah. is actually a myth that, that the priesthood wanted to tell because they wanted that to be the truth of their history. But it, when you look at the actual history, it was a lot messier than that. Uh, the history of Judaism is uh, not as straightforward as the, you know, the second temple priesthood wanted it to sound basically. Yeah, and the, the the weeping thing is sort of a common trope too. Like you got Isis weeping over Osiris, you have um, Venus weeping over Adonis, and then her her tears become like a tree that grows out. So a lot of that commonality happening, where there's like this sort of like mourning, where you have Mary mourning over Jesus. Like I don't know, I don't know if that's a thing or not. I don't know what you think, but um, I I don't know. I think there's a lot of stuff happening. With these, and here's yeah. the last, last thing I want right. to say. There, there are a lot of texts of mourning the dead God before He resurrects. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, a lot of religions. It, it's replicated across several different um, continents, even yeah. countries and so on. Well, the reason why I bring all this up is because when when you bring when you when you try to when you try to like throw this out there, people will say, "Well, these are all agricultural." It's like, so, and so that that's like saying, "Okay, there's no sports except for hockey. No, no sports is except for." <laughs> And I point out, okay, there's basketball, there's football, and then you say, well, those ones don't have pucks. This one has a puck. Right. <laughs> there's so much. Right, right, yeah. Uh, the, ask- the argument from difference is a common fallacy. Uh, and and it's, it's funny because it only happens in this field. Um, when, when you go into other fields, historians are much more familiar with uh, the science of literature and the way allegory and the way emulation and mimesis and other techniques work they're, they would never make the argument, for example, and I use this example in my book, but no one would ever in, in any other field would make the argument that West Side Story is not based on Romeo and Juliet. And you say like, oh, but they have like guns and they're like Puerto Ricans. Can't possibly be. It's like, so you don't understand how literary illusion works, how mimesis works, right? And, and that was the same in antiquity too, right? So these are not valid ways to respond to discovering the way stories get borrowed and restructured and refleshed 
uh, in new ways. And in fact, it was very, even more typical back then to do this. Um, one other example that I give is there's a story of Lady Felinion, which is this, it's a revenant tale. It's basically, it's a ghost story, but it's about this woman, kind of like a vampire story. And this is a ancient Greek story where this woman uh, was uh, illicitly having a love affair with this guy. And then she gets killed or dies or whatever. And then she keeps visiting him uh, and she wakes from the grave and would visit him and go back to the grave. Uh, and then once she finally gets caught, she drops back to a corpse and that ends the, the curse or whatever you want to call it. Um, but there's, uh, and this is in Phlegon. You see this story is told in Phlegon is a second century uh, author. Uh, but you go forward about 1500 years and there's another ghost story told in Ireland. It is the exact same story. But it's set in Ireland. It's set in a castle. It's all the characters have now have Irish names. Uh, the storyline is structured to fit Irish customs. Uh, so, like you say, like, but no, it can't be the same story. It's like, yeah, it's the same story. It gets updated to the cultural context and the religious context of the time that it was written. And so, this is very common. This process it happens all the time, uh, and it happened all the time in antiquity as well. So, so yeah, the, the, anyone who makes these kind of argument from difference is basically advertising that they haven't studied literary theory. They don't know how literature gets constructed historically. And and that's, you really can't be doing Jesus studies if you don't know that. That's a good point. Really good point. The myth vision is back for more. Thank you, Derek. Anything shocking you've discovered lately in the vein of biblical studies, Dr. Carrier? Lately? Um, shocking lately. No, I, I can't think of anything offhand. There might be something. I'm just not remembering it. But <laughs> uh if, if I did, it, it's, I blogged about it. So you can go check my blog and see what, what are the scandalous things. Are. I think maybe the most, it's not very scandalous, but uh, the most thing, I did a blog recently or within the last six months, I think. On uh, Now, when I was doing my work on, on the history of the city of Jesus, I found a lot of reasons to suspect. And I have a footnote stating my suspicions, but they're just suspicions and not premises, uh, that Jesus was understood to be Michael. Uh, at the angel Michael, and that, that this actually predates Christianity, that there's that Michael was understood to be the, the firstborn son of God in Jewish angelology, even before uh, Christianity arose. Um, but certainly from very early dates of Christianity, that Jesus was just another name for Michael. Uh, and, but I couldn't prove it. And I saw lots of hints and suggestions and things. Like, oh, it looks like that's the case, but I can't solidly prove it. And I read a book recently, a peer-reviewed book on this very question, uh, and it, it presents a lot of really good evidence. I think is not enough to prove it conclusively, but a lot prove it a lot better. Like the evidence is stronger than I, I even thought. Uh, and I did an article. I wrote a basically review summarizing the evidence that there is and how strong and, or weak it is. Uh, is what that scandalous? I don't know if that's scandalous. Well, Metatron is the same thing, right? So Metatron is an as a title for a role. Uh, and, and right. So like Jewish angelology sometimes imagine different angels being assigned that role. It's called uh, little Yahweh too. Little Yahweh. Right. Yeah. It's uh, basically for people who don't know the Metatron is uh, when, when Moses met the burning bush and whenever the Bible says that, you know, like Israel literally had a wrestling match with God on the street and, and Moses like meets God as a burning bush. Uh, there's a story in the Bible, I can't remember if it's Exodus or whatever, where you actually see God's naked ass uh, off a mountain, right? Like there's like all of these, like there's God seems to be like very physical being, just like gods of all the other surrounding cultures. Uh, now that's got reinterpreted later because you can't have an anthropomorphic God like this. So it got reinterpreted as, oh, these are all angels representing God, uh, right? So like the burning bush is the Metatron. Metatron is the one who speaks the voice of God. Uh, and the movie Dogma makes fun of this with, uh, if you hear the voice of God, your brain will explode. But if, if he speaks through the Metatron as an instrument, then, then it's safe to hear. But, you know, uh, but this, this was actual belief back then, uh, that the Metatron was this angel. And some Jews believed it was always secretly Michael. Others thought that the role could be moved around. Different angels could be assigned the role. Uh, but yeah, so like I talk about this in my article on, is Jesus Michael? Uh, and the thing is, is the Jehovah's Witnesses, this is an article of faith that Jesus is Michael. Uh, so so it's like scandalous to suggest that the Jehovah's Witnesses have something right. Uh, they're actually right about this. Like the, the most heretical thing they say turns out to be true. Uh, I think it actually, I think it could be, I think it could be true. I think it is very likely that the earliest Christians even, uh, and even before that, possibly the Qumranites, for example, 
right. thought that uh, God's Savior, God's the firstborn son of God, the high priest of God's celestial temple, all of this stuff, that it was really Michael and that you would just use code names uh, to talk about him. Well, I mean, because you look at Revelation and that whoever wrote that probably could have reflected that as well because you like Michael and his angels fighting against Satan and the demons. Yeah, Why there's not? a lot of celestial imagery in there where, where like yeah. Jesus is born. Uh, it seems to be like he's born and killed in outer space. And there's a whole story where it's like it's up in the stars and it's going on. Uh, but Revelation is so bizarre and the way it's written and, it, and it's so deeply allegorical that it's, you can't really get any literalist interpretations out of it. Sure. D.E. says... My issue with H.J. Scholars, what's H.J. Scholar? Historical Jesus. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Historical Jesus Scholars is how they decide what sayings in the gospel were made up and what Jesus must have said. Is there a sound way to do it? <laughs> that's a legitimate question. Yeah, um, is there a sound way to do it? So there's the book called The Five Gospels uh, in which the Jesus Seminar, uh, which is part of it, which was a, a project of the Westar Institute. Uh, I am actually now a Westar fellow, so I'm actually part of the same group. Uh, I wasn't then, obviously, so I was not involved in the the Jesus uh, project, but um, but it's the same group. And they came out with a book called The Five Gospels, where they basically present all five gospels, and they, they say five because they include Thomas, uh, and um, and then which things are how confident were they that Jesus really said them? They have a little structure for how they rate these things and stuff. But it was done through voting, which is not the best. It's not a very scholarly way to do it. But the idea being that the scholars who were voting were expressing their supposedly informed, studied opinion, right? So it was basically a way to measure co confidence among the consensus of scholars. That was that was the goal of it. Um, and so, uh, so it's a useful way to look at what is, and it's very main. This is mainstream, right? So this. Is, it's not evangelical apologetics. So if you go and look at this, you can see what the mainstream consensus was. This is late 60s, I think, early 70s um, regarding this, right? Now, when they were doing that, they were using a lot of methodologies that have since been discredited. Uh, and and th those methodologies are still being used. Even Bart Ehrman still uses them. He's kind of missed the memo. Uh, all, all of the peer-reviewed studies of these criteria have concluded that they're useless and don't work. Not useless, but they, they're deeply flawed and, and and shouldn't just be used the way they have been used. Um, so there, we don't really have a methodology for this. Uh, and But there will be a lot of scholars will insist we do uh, because they need there to be. And, with, and they don't like not having a methodology. So they want to be able to figure this out. Uh, but the end result is that everybody comes up with different conclusions about which statements really came from Jesus or not. Um, and so is, is, there, is there a way to do it? Uh, not with the information we have, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think there is any, none of the criteria work the way they're supposed to work, particularly on the sayings of Jesus, especially since we know before the gospels are written that tons of sayings of Jesus were coming from revelation. Uh, and actually some sayings of Jesus are coming from scripture, including scriptures that we don't have. Uh, so we have this like in first Clement, uh, he, he says, and as, as Jesus said, uh, but then he quotes, he quotes scriptures. And then there's another place where he, he as, as the scriptures say, and he quotes Jesus from the Gospels, but it it's a quote that's slightly different, but very close. But it's not from any scripture we know. So, and that got into the Gospels as a saying of Jesus. Uh, and so there, there's, I give these examples in, in on the historicity of Jesus in, I think, chapter eight. I have some of the examples of these. Um, so there's lots of stuff that it's deeply unreliable in terms of where these things came from. And then there's lots of sayings that people just wanted Jesus to have said. And so they just made Jesus say them. Uh, and so what we would need normally as historians is earlier, more eyewitness documents to tell the difference between invented sayings and true sayings. But we don't have that at all. <laughs> right? So, so it's not like Joseph Smith. Or, or you could pick almost any other, even the cargo cults. We actually have eyewitness scientists who documented the start of the religion. Uh, it, it was called the Vilala Madness. Um, just by coincidence, we had, you know, scientists there that were documenting this. We don't have that for, for Jesus. So we really don't have the way to tell which things are authentic and which things are not. Uh, and, and, and all of the attempts to do this are deeply flawed. You can show that they're fallacious. They don't work on any other body of texts. Um, so, so yes, the answer is no, I don't, I don't think we can do it. Good question. Good answer. Joel Pearson. What's going on, buddy? What no, or we know about Orcius Festus <laughs> Did any other people have community names in it? Biggest dick aside. aside. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, funniest scene in, in cinema history. Uh, okay. So for people who don't know, Porcius Festus is happy. The pig. 
Uh, that is his actual name. Wow. And this is supposedly, uh, I, I think, a Roman prefect. I can't recall. Uh, he's yeah. in the book, book of Acts. Um, can, I can't remember if we have independent attestation of Porcius Festus. Oh, yeah, he's in Josephus. Uh, okay, right. So um, the name is, there's nothing weird about the name. Uh, people, people don't know. This is one of the first things I learned in, under my advisor at Columbia when I, I did my PhD dissertation is that when you translate all Roman names, they all sound like mafia names, right? Uh, you know, Cicero's big nose. Uh, like you, you can just go through all yeah, of them. Yeah. They, they all are just like, you know, Sammy the snake. And you know, like, it's, it's just like all these guys. It, it sounds all like official and haughty, like Porcius Festus, the mighty Porcius Festus. But what they hear is the mighty happy the pig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, one, of, one, of, so, one of the guys who rebelled against Nero, his name's Gaius Julius Windex. It's actually well, Vindex, but the V was pronounced Which I think is, um, it's not Victor, but it's it's uh, something like that. Um, yeah. But anyway, yeah, the, the translations, yeah, the, the trans, what the words mean is that all Romans had silly names, like all of them. Yeah. Uh, and um, so oh, so that, that's not there's, weird. There's, there's, a, there's a Roman emperor named Pupianus. I'm not kidding. Well, emperor see, now you're, 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 you're finding funny names when they when they're spoken in english i mean right. even the actual yeah, name like mean, even yeah. when it's translated like what the latin what the latin speaker would hear sure to our mind is funny yeah. uh and so <laughs> so yeah so it's it's not uncommon and well, caligula is another one like caligula sounds like an ominous name it's yeah. little boots uh, and it was actually just a nickname he got because when he, he deserves he was, to have that name right when he was a baby he was raised in a military camp and so his mom's knitted little fake military boots for him and then so everybody kept calling him little boots and and then that just became his name and so he was little boots and so even as the emperor the mighty emperor of the vast roman empire he was behold little boots right that's, like, that was, that's what he was called that's like, he's like he's like yeah. a trump figure like little hands you know what i mean <laughs> yeah, except weirdly more <laughs> rational was um, a raging, that's a whole other whole he other was a raging madman too just like trump Look, anyways, there's there's your poopy anus for you. Poopy anus, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but um, yeah, let's keep going. Uh, Eric, doesn't the idea of Jesus fill a gap that was lacking from the Old Testament, like forgiving each other and helping the needy and in, incarcerated? Um, all of that's actually in the Old Testament. Uh, they're, they're actually, and even what isn't uh, of the things that Jesus taught. Um, lots of people were teaching them, uh, not just rabbis. We have lots of things that Jesus taught are being taught by rabbis, Hillel and Shammai, for example. They were Great example. Pre predate Christianity and yet, uh, or roughly the same time even, but um, but th they're already teaching these kinds of things. Uh, but you also have it in Cynic philosophy and other philosophies around. So Hellenistic influence is bringing in a lot of ethical teachings that, that Jesus' teachings, Jesus is actually behind the curve in a lot of things. Like, like yeah. the teachings of, of the New Testament, of the Gospels, are actually not the most enlightened teachings that you will find in the ancient world. Uh, they're, they're actually more enlightened philosophy. Um, you so I give an example of Musonius Rufus. I have a whole essay that I've written on him, uh, which you can find at the secular web. Uh, Musonius Rufus was considered the second Socrates. He was like the most revered and respected uh, Roman philosopher, bar none, basically. Uh, and he dates roughly the 60s AD. So he's, he's roughly the same time as Jesus. Uh, but his teachings are actually more sophisticated and are more progressive uh, than the stuff that Jesus is talking about. I give some examples. I think also I have this article you can find if you go to my website and go, there's a menu item at top called writings. And then there's Jesus studies as one of the selections in there. And you go in there and then you go look at Jesus as a philosopher, like search the word philosopher. I oh, think. yeah. The, the cynics. And I, the cynics. And I, I did the second article on this. The, the, look at the second one. That's the best one where I talk about the, the, the Christian apologists are trying to argue that Jesus should be included in encyclopedias of philosophy as long with famous philosophers. And, and, and I have a whole detailed article as to why we don't do that, nor should we. Uh, and, and in the process of that, I talk about things, how there are a lot of more progressive philosophers, more feminist philosophers, for example, explicitly in the Roman empire, uh, than Jesus. Now, no one like no one in antiquity was like up to current speed on, on ethics, but but there was there was actually more enlightened stuff going on uh, than Jesus is talking about. Yeah, I think like sayings like "Let the dead bury the dead." Like you could see the cynics, like Diogenes, for example, mm -hmm. the cynic. He one of his um, attributed sayings was, "They asked him what he, what he wants to do with his body when he dies." 
And he was like, oh, throw me over the bridge into the water with a stick in my hand so I can fight the fish. <laughs> <laughs> they go, why would you want to do that? He goes, because why would I care about my body after I'm dead? <laughs> yeah. Dad's that- is a is a great character. Uh, there's a lot of cool stories about him and a lot of interesting sayings. Um, but yeah, he's, he's, he's the beginning of the cynics, right? He founded right. the cynic school of philosophy. Uh, that was basically the hippies. They were the ancient hippies, yeah, yeah. the counterculturalists. Um, they deeply questioned cultural norms. Uh, a lot of atheists and, too. uh, yeah, not necessarily. I mean, they're, they're more skeptic. Uh, like it didn't matter. Like their attitude was, it doesn't matter whether gods exist. They don't help you anyway. So fuck them. Uh, it, so it wasn't so much like going around saying they don't exist is like, who cares? What, what good are they? Um, <laughs> <laughs> What's the cynic position? Yeah. James Wisdom, thank you for the super chat. I heard Tiberius Pantera was Jesus' real father. Interesting. I haven't, I don't I didn't know Tiberius was attached to this legendary name. Um, so th- this was a joke, uh, probably started by Jewish opponents of Christianity in the second century. Uh, and it's a reaction to the gospel nativity stories. So, and we see that the first time we see this joke, I think. I think is either in Trifo, which is Justin's Kelsey. writing, Kelsey. or in Contra Celsus by Origin. Yeah. Um, but the, both of these around the same time. So Celsus and uh, Justin are writing around 160. Um, it's the first time we hear this, uh, which is the, it was a joke based on a pun in Greek, which is the difference between Parthenos and Panthera. They sound similar, right? Uh, and Parthenos means virgin. So the Christians were teaching that Jesus is born of a virgin. So the Jews made fun of this and then whole nativity narrative itself by saying, no, no, that was just a confusion for Panther, which is a common Roman nickname. There's lots of Roman soldiers who were called Panther. They're like, I'm Panther. You know, that was the way they would like uh, toxic masculinity in their life. But anyway, Panther was a common Roman uh, soldier name. And so they said, well, she just uh, had an affair with a soldier and made up the story about being a virgin uh, conceiving yeah. and stuff the um, the but James if this is a polemic this is a joke that jews made up and it made it up after the gospels were written um ironically it survives and becomes adopted by positive christianity which is the nazi sect of christianity and and they take it as true and that therefore jesus is an arian a true arian who is sticking it to the jews and so so this 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 joke that jews made up to like make fun of christians what about ends up being treated as fact by the anti-semites of uh, the 20th century what about, what about the tosefta that says that they were pr- they were actually healing in the name of jesus pantera oh uh that's in the talmud actually i yeah. think uh there's yeah. lots of references to yeah the pantera joke gets into the talmud as well um, tabor tells me that this 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 sort of idea that it, it's a pun doesn't come along till the 19th century but I'm not saying I know. More yeah, than I'm, I'm pretty sure the way it's framed in the original text, I can't remember if it's, again, it's Kelsus or Justin. Um, it's obvious. It's an obvious joke. Uh, and, and it's the, it's for, framed in the same way that all jokes in antiquity are framed. So so I, even though no one explicitly says what the, like no one sits down and explains the joke, uh, which most humor is like that. No, no one's going to sit down and explain to you why that joke is funny or how they came up with the joke. Uh, you're just supposed to get it. Uh, but if you look at it from that point of view, you can get the joke pretty good. It's obviously a joke, right? So, uh, and it's meant to be punished. Puns are very popular. This is another thing people don't know. The pun, puns were one of the most popular forms of humor in the ancient world. So, so you see that a lot. Definitely. Uh, so, so in context, it's, it's just obviously a pun. John Macher, thank you for the super chat. Playing devil's advocate, how would you interpret God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, Galatians 4? Would, his, would this not lend credence to that Paul placed Jesus firmly on earth? Yeah, that's that probably after the brothers thing, that would be like the next thing that you would appeal to. The problem is that he almost right away says that he's these women he's talking about are allegories and he explains the allegories. They represent world orders that you're born to. They're not actual literal women. It's he's not talking about biology. Um, He's talking about metaphysics, actually. Uh, And and when you understand and this is in the middle of an argument that starts in Galatians three proceeds through Galatians four and it follows very well understood structures of rhetoric, the way speeches were con- constructed in antiquity. Um, when, when you analyze it using the ancient modes of rhetoric, uh, you can tell that what he's talking about is allegory here. It, it's it, even if Jesus had an actual biological mother, that's not what Paul is talking about here. It's not relevant uh, to to the argument he's making. So, so this isn't in context. This this passage isn't usable. When it gets used, it's taken out of context, and then apologists will insist the context is irrelevant or try to deny the context changes the the meaning the context totally changes the meaning uh and i have a whole article on this uh galatians um 
Galatians 4. I can't remember the title of it, but if you go to my blog, type in Galatians 4, uh, you'll get the article. And I go into like analyzing the rhetoric and the way that speech is constructed uh, and, and what it is that Paul's actually talking about and why interpreting this as reference to a biological woman makes no sense. It's, it doesn't contribute to Paul's argument at all and it wouldn't work, wouldn't even make sense in that context. Yeah, and, and just to just to compare it to other myths outside of Judaism and Christianity, the ancient Babylonian myths, they're all born of seed too. Like Enki's seed is creating other gods. Like the, the whole seed thing. True, be- true. I, I don't think that's what's going on here. But um, I, I, Paul's talking cosmology, not not right. divine genealogy. But um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely the use of, of metaphor. And there's lots of people who are born of a woman who are yeah. not existent people. But that, that's definitely true. Uh, because mythology, all the mythology, all the mythological gods had some sort of mother who also didn't exist. Uh, but right. that isn't what Paul's doing, and I don't think Paul would be talking about the myth that way. Yeah, you know, well, I, the only reason I throw that out there is just because you know there's other I, examples of there being you know the sea, born of a seed or born of the woman. But I will say this though: this is one of the reasons why I still lean towards there being a guy because I do think that language, even in, ambiguous as it is, I still think it leaves it open for there being a guy. Right. Mm-hmm. So I just sort of just, I'm, you know, as a, as you guys can tell, I'm very neutral on this. Subject. Yeah. Yeah. I, and at least then you're like assigning weight to it yeah. in an informed way. Right. So, yeah. so that, that, that isn't a problem really. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Ken Scaletta just says three. Any idea what that means? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the super chat though. I appreciate that. Uh, maybe he had, maybe that was a mistake. Maybe there's a, it might have been. Oh, yeah. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. What's the Nake? Neonikos and Make Neoniskos. Oh, it's Greek. Okay. Uh, but the Neoniskos, I think he means naked. Uh, missed the D. Um, okay. So in, in Mark, this is a lot of people don't know this story. This one doesn't get told in, in church sermons very much, I'm sure. Uh, when Jesus is arrested in the Gospel of Mark, uh, there's this young man, Neoniskos means young man. Uh, there's this young man who's just wearing a linen robe with nothing under, it specifically says there's nothing underneath. And the soldiers try to grab him and the robe gets torn off and he flees away naked. Uh, and so a lot of people are like, what the hell is that story? Like, why would that even get mentioned? Why is it important to mention that it was a naked boy at the arrest? Um, what, what is going on here? Uh, and a lot, there have been lots of theories uh, that have been proposed. I, I think the obvious one relates to uh, resurrection allegory. Uh, it was very common, and you even see this in Paul in some places, to refer to the body of flesh and the resurrected body using garments terminology. So the body of flesh was disposable linen, a coarse garment, and the resurrection garment would be a glorious robe of white, right, for example. So the, the resurrection body w- w- would be compared to garments that you wear. And then when you're naked, that's your soul. Your soul without a body is naked. And you look yeah. at uh, 2 Corinthians 5, Paul's using this this, this terminology. Uh, and but we find it many other places. So this is actually a common metaphor. We find use. this exact same word used in other mystery cults for initiation. That would oh, yeah, like right. That. Yeah. And so the, this terminology is not just Christian. It, it appears, right. right. It's, it's mostly Jewish. It's But there's some Platonic, some Platonic texts use similar terminology for the body. The body is a tent. The body is a rough garment that you throw away, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then the, you know, the future glorious body would be different. Now in Mark, in the immediately next chapter, Right, so the, the this I think not the immediately next chapter. So fourteen, what is it? Is it sixteen or fifteen? I can't remember exactly where it happens, but it's probably I think it's sixteen. So it's like the next event, uh, basically, is there's another Neoniscus, and he's the one in the tomb. So there's another young man, and neither of these young men are named, but they're both used. They're both called Neoniscus. They're both called young man. Wow. But the one in the tomb is wearing a white robe, and he's talking about resurrection. Sounds like so what do you have? You have a symbol for death, the the coarse body, the linen garment is torn away, you have a naked soul, and then what happens later? You meet the same young man, and he's in a resurrection garment. And it's symbolizing resurrection. This symbolizes death, nakedness of the soul, resurrection. So it's wow. all just metaphor and allegory. I think that's the, the point of it. And it, it sounds like these are like some initiates going, some maybe like an initiate. I don't know. That's, that's what it sounds like. There, there have been some people trying to argue that it's an initiation. Oftentimes when they do that, they use the secret gospel of Mark. I personally think that's a modern forgery. Um, sure. and, and many people have suggested that. It's, I'm not alone. Um, but but yeah, there, this, this young man gets more involved with Jesus 
and naked, more naked and more involved with Jesus in the secret gospel of Mark. That's Yeah, it's a little weird. Anyway, Sebastian Elder, thank you for the super chat. Are you familiar with the book Jesus, A New Vision by Whiteley Strieber? Curious if you had an opinion on it. Whitley Strieber. Uh, I don't know that. No, I haven't read that. Okay. Well, there. Well, we'll have to check that out. Thank you for that super chat. I really appreciate it. Temi just drops a five on us. I think it's a euro. Thank you for that. Appreciate it's a pound, that. But okay. <laughs> all right. All right. See, I don't know my. I don't travel much. So I have no idea. Uh, let's see. I think that might. No, this. I think there's a couple more. Here we go. We we yeah. We could we could kind of go quickly on these guys. I know you got to go soon, but um, de is it better argument against born of a woman in Galatians four is to ask would anyone need to mention that someone is born of a woman? I, well, I wouldn't say better or worse. I would say that is a contributing argument. So like in, any any analysis of this text, you do have to take into account that that is a count against it. Uh, that, yeah. that it and, and it's even worse than that because it's like, why even drop that mention specifically where he does in the argument that he's making, right? So yeah. when, when you think of it, like it doesn't solve anything. And, and usually the proposals don't make sense either. Like for instance, you know, well, he had to establish that he was Jewish. And it's like, well, he doesn't say it's a Jewish mother. So that yeah. doesn't establish that, right? So clearly that's not what he's doing. And so like to understand what an author is doing, you have to look at how does this work in the context of the argument that he's making. And sure. the, the usual interpretations don't make sense in that argument. Uh, whereas if you look at what he tells you just a few lines later, like what I'm doing with these women, then it does make sense. If you just take his own statement of what is the allegory here, uh, yeah. then it all makes sense. And so you don't like, but it is true that it, there's no reason to mention that. Uh, right. Why? Why would you say that? Like it doesn't. It doesn't uh, serve any logic. We have two left, and uh, thank you for the super chat. Text gaming. When did the church invent Mark nine through twenty? I think chapter sixteen, verses nine through twenty. Okay, I think is what they mean. Um, I have a whole chapter on this on Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. I basically did a whole extra dissertation on this very question. Uh, it looks like it was so. Verses 9 to 20 in chapter 16 look like they were a summary of the other Gospels in a commentary on Mark, uh, and, and and possibly by Ariston. There, there's Ariston or Aristion. There were these. There, we know there was a guy in the second century writing these commentaries. It, there's a lot of convergent evidence. It's not conclusive, but it suggests that this is where it started. And then someone took that and tacked it onto the end of the Gospel of Mark in a manuscript. They might have originally meant it not to be a text of Mark, but kind of like an appendix, uh, you know, like, oh, you know, as Aristion says, here's a summary, yada, yada. But then that got incorporated into the text. And so that all of the indicators that it was just a, a footnote um, from a commentary got erased. And so it just became part of the, the text of uh, the Gospel of Mark. Um, that process where it got integrated into Mark appears to have began, appears to have happened in the third century. Um, because it definitely has happened by the time we look at manuscripts in the 4th century. And there's a lot of other converging evidence of, of this timeline. Interesting. Very interesting. Good question. Thank you for that. Chris Wood, what do you guys think of Mark Allegro's sacred mushroom and the cross hypothesis that the mystery was a psychedelic mushroom? <laughs> yeah, that's been thoroughly discredited um, and soundly. Um, and they use art, so, they use like church art that's from like 500s and 600s and like maybe even, I think later. even later than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's no, right. There's there's no evidence that mushroom eating had anything to do with the origins of Christianity. If it had anything to do by the time you get to the Middle Ages, you're no longer talking about the origins of Christianity, so it's moot. Yeah. Uh, and, and so th that kind of argument oh, just oh. doesn't hold up Fine. now. It's not that they didn't know about this stuff. Right. So like psychedelics, like psychedelic substances were a known thing in the ancient Hi, world. Hi, um, yeah. And ergot is, is a common one. Yeah. And, and there were the, the, the vapors that came out, like, I can't remember what the actual chemical composition, but there's vapors, this, this gas that it, it Delphi. emanates from Delphi. That's yeah. Right. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, so, so like these were known things. But when you look at the writings of early Christianity, especially like Paul, there's no reference to any kind of sacred substance that's sure. relevant. What you do see, however, are things references to things like incubation, like uh, you know, sleep, like uh, sensory deprivation, uh, basically, and, and marathon chanting and dancing and things. There are a lot of uh, we know there are a lot of natural triggers. You don't need to take psychedelics to trigger hallucinations. Altered yeah. states of consciousness can be reached by a number of different techniques. Right. Uh, and, and we have references to those techniques or at least allusions to them in early Christian writings, whereas we don't have allusions to psychedelic drugs. Um, and so so I, I, it, the argument isn't sustainable, I think, uh, 
there, there's not really anything to do with it. And, and it's been revived. There's some new book going around by this other guy who's trying to make the same argument. And it, it's, it was dead then and is dead, dead argument now. Yeah, the only thing I could think of is from talking to M. David Litwa on some of these heretical groups that were in the second century. There was a lot of there was some of that going on. No, I almost well, see. There's a problem with that is that we only know that from their enemies who are writing dishonest right. polemics. I was, I was just going to say. Uh, so, so this is the problem. Is like we don't know if any of that's true, uh, right? It's like just because no, they said true. they were doing it, it's like you know that wow they were doing all this weird stuff with semen and like. Yeah, yeah, really, yeah. Were they no, really? Or, or is that just some lies you guys are making up, right? Uh, what what I do so. believe, though, is this right here, real quick. I believe that this was a repurposed hymn by the Nassines that they were identifying Jesus with Osiris and uh, Addis and Adonis. I don't think, I think that's a, that to me makes sense. Because why would you pass that down? Why would you want I to tell people that? I, I would need to know the source for that. Where, where that's is that Hippolytus. From? Hippolytus, Reputation. Okay, Hi Hippolytus. It's Hippolytus. Yeah. But yeah, okay. Uh, okay. So, Reputation of all heresies. Yeah, right. I, I beg right. everybody who's watching this to go look into this. He yeah, talks about I, a hymn. I would have to look into that. I, I haven't looked into that, whether that fits into the polemic category or whether that's a, a legitimate well, no, it's transfer. Good for, it makes sense on a mythicism standpoint because early Christians, as far as the second century, were already identifying Jesus with all these yeah. other... Well, I mean, it, it would make sense even in a historicist context because they're doing the same things, sure, right? Sure. So, so it doesn't. By the time you see Hippolytus writing about this stuff, whether Jesus existed or not was an unknown fact. No, no one would know the answer to that question. Right, by right. right. Um, but, but the idea of syncretizing and trying to cross boundary, do this idea of identifying your god with all these other gods, and say, oh, it's the same guy, you're just using a different name. That was actually standard back then. Everybody was doing that. So, so, so that's that's not even an unusual thing to do. Uh, what, what's actually unusual is the, the so-called orthodox pushback against yeah. this, right? So so their insistence that that is not what's happening and, and then condemning people who suggest that as heretics, that is actually unusual. That was not a typical way that's to handle that kind of text. That's what I'm saying. I think that, I think, yeah, I mean, that, that's a whole other topic. So uh, we've got yeah. we do to go. <laughs> Last super chat. It's not even a question. It's just a, just a comment. Not all gods are oh, born of Yeah, right, right. I, I have a whole other article, uh, Virgin Birth. It's pagan, guys. Get over it. Uh, yeah. So you can go to my blog and search for that. And I, I do mention that uh, that example, among others. Yeah, good point. Athena was born from Zeus' forehead. Yeah, that's a really good really good point. And um, that is it for today, guys. I really appreciate everybody super chatting and commenting. And um, anything else you want to say? Anything books come out? Any com books coming out or anything like that? <sighs> no, nothing Nothing new book-wise. Um, just blogging, really, is my, my new thing. Um, so I would ask people... Like was, I've moved to California to help take care of my disabled dad uh, locally. Um, I don't live with him, but I, I visit him uh, every week to help uh, with care. And uh, it's very expensive in California. Uh, my All my expenses went up by 50%. Uh, so I strongly encourage people who want to see more of my blogging and see more of my work uh, to support me on Patreon. Uh, and you can find a link to that on my website. Yeah, guys, there it is. Check out richardcarrier.info and look for the Patreon button and you can you can help him donate. And there's also, I teach those courses. So if you go to, there's a classes link, you can go look at, I teach 10 different courses every month, uh, starting the first of the month. And if you're, if you're interested in those, they're just simple, short, uh, self-directed study, um, Q&A type classroom environment. So um, for people who are interested in that, check that out. Uh, that helps support me as well. And also I, I just love conveying the information and, and being able to to have like answer people's questions and things like that uh, in that kind of context. Also, if you guys are watching right now, don't forget to hit that like button and uh, you know subscribe and all that stuff. And you have just attained true gnosis. <laughs>